wish each one of you a ketiva, a chatima tova, a good inscription, and a seal in the Book of Life. And for those of you that are fasting, it's some kal, an easy fast. And as I said last night, and as uh, our Vice President David Glickman reminded us, it's a really hot day today. And um, I know the tradition says you're not supposed to eat and drink, but I don't think they had 106 degrees in mind uh, when they were sitting in Poland and made all of those rules. <laughs> so, if you are fasting, and they don't eat food, but please drink some water during the day today, especially in the break, uh, as we're moving between uh, here and our own congregation, Kolomi. Um, we don't want to, anyone to pass out. God doesn't want that, for sure. Um, in May of uh, 1972, Judaism went through a dramatic transition. The Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, my seminary, ordained its very first woman rabbi, Rabbi Sally Friesen. She's retired now, but served for many years in Monmouth, New Jersey. This was a historical moment, not only for Reform Judaism, but in truth, it was something historic and a transitional movement moment for all of Judaism. And in truth, all of America. In the midst of the feminist revolution of the 1960s and early 70s, Reform Judaism finally lived out its founding principles of equality between men and women in spiritual matters that dates back to the 1820s. Her ordination was a moment that was held by liberal Jews around the world and condemned by Orthodox Judaism and even conservative Judaism. Two years later, in 1974, the Reconstructionist movement would ordain Rabbi Sandy Sasso. And in 75, Rabbi Jackie Tabak became Britain's first female rabbi ordained by the Reform movement. And finally, in 1984, the conservative movement jumped aboard a train that had already left the station. <laughs> Rabbi Amy Eilberg became the first woman ordained by JTS, the Jewish Theological Seminary of the Conservative Movement. But each of these moments were transition moments in the history of our people. Fast forward to just a year ago when the Open Orthodox Movement ordained its first rabbi, Rabbi Sarah Herbitz. And in truth, there are a handful of other women who have been ordained in the Orthodox world, including here in Los Angeles, Rev. Mimi Fagelson, who teaches at the American Jewish University, and my dear and good friend, Rabbi Dina Nyman, who has her own pulpit in Riverdale, New York. Each of these moments are holy moments, moments hailed by a community of Jews and celebrated. For many of us, here today, it's hard to imagine a Judaism without the voice of women as leaders, both ordained and as lay people. But each of these moments were indeed transition moments. This summer after my time in Israel, I went on a study mission with the American Jewish Archives of the College Institute and the American Jewish Women's Archives. Twenty American women rabbis went to rediscover the life of Rabina Regina Jonas. The group included the five women rabbis that I talked about this morning, as well as the first American four, plus Rabbi Tabak from England. Since the fall of the Iron Curtain, and in particularly the fall of the Berlin Wall, the story of Rabina Jonas has been rediscovered it turns out that the headlines in 1972 were wrong. Rabbi Priesen was not the first woman ordained ever, but the first in America. It turns out that Rabbi Regina Jonas was ordained in 1935 in Berlin. And so 20 women rabbis and women scholars, reform movement lay leaders traveled together to rediscover her life and her contributions to the Jewish world, and to dedicate a memorial plaque in her memory at Terezin, the model ghetto city of the Nazis, where Abiner Jonas ministered for two years before her death in Auschwitz in 1944. 
We began and gathered in Berlin. We went to the house she grew up in. Today, a plaque stands outside of her home. We visited the remnants of the synagogue she taught and lectured in. And we had an opportunity to read her letters and documents from a very small archive that are left of her materials. It's small, maybe an inch high. This coming year will be 80 years since her ordination, which is a story in and of itself. She was born in 1912 in Berlin. Her father died when she was a young girl, and she was raised in poverty by a single mother. But she was a bright student and loved her Jewishness. According to her biographer, Elisa Kapchik, in 1924, she matriculated at the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft der Judentums, founded in Berlin in 1872. This was the forerunner of our Hebrew Union College. This liberal institution, even then, admitted women as students. But Jonas was the only woman who hoped to be ordained. All of her fellow women students were studying for an academic teacher's degree. Edward Bannon, professor of Talmud at the Hochschule, was responsible for rabbinic ordination. And he was the supervisor of Jonas's final thesis, which dealt with the topic of may a woman hold rabbinic office. Submitted in June of 1930, this paper is one of the first known attempts to find a halakhic basis for the ordination of women. Jonas's thesis actually received a grade of good. Soon thereafter, however, Edward Banneth died and his successor, Hannah Albeck, proved unwilling to ordain a woman. None of the other professors of the Hochschule raised their voice on the issue. As a result, Jonas graduated only as a religious teacher. In the following year, she taught at several girls' school in Berlin, where she was known to be very popular and a committed teacher. And then in 1933, the workload for Jewish teachers increased tremendously. Since the students who had to leave the public schools due to anti-Semitism not only needed Jewish knowledge, but also needed to learn how to be proud of their Jewish heritage. Nevertheless, Jonas continued to pursue ordination. Finally, in 1935, Rabbi Max Dinerman, executive director of the Liberale Rabbiner Maband Conference of Liberal Rabbis, agreed to ordain her on behalf of the conference. Her diploma of ordination reads this way. Since I saw that her heart is with God in Israel, and that she dedicates her soul to her goal, and that she fears God, and that she passed the examination in matters of religious law, I herewith certify that she is qualified to answer questions of religious law and entitled to hold the rabbinic office. And may God protect her and guide her on all of her ways. She has the heart of a rabbi. Jonas became the first woman to be ordained as a rabbi. But soon the nightmare of the Shoah was in full blast. As many Jews and rabbis fled the country, they were rounded up. Rabbiner Jonas taught in many congregations. She pastored the elders that were left in town after Kristallnacht, and finally, along with her mother, was sent to Terezin in 1942. For two years there, she taught and preached and held up the spirit of the Jews. She led worship. She worked closely with the great psychologist Viktor Frankl on a suicide watch in the camp. We went to Terezin this summer. And we saw there in their archives the list of 24 lectures that she gave while there. Lectures, adult education that you might have heard from me over the course of the last number of years. Lectures on Shabbat, the holy days, discussions about God and mitzvot. In a small sample of her writings that were left, she said this. Our Jewish people was planted by God into history as a blessed nation. Blessed by God means to offer blessing, loving kindness, and loyalty, regardless 
of the place and situation. Humility before God, selfless love for his creatures, sustain the world. It is Israel's task to build these pillars of the world. Man and woman, woman and man alike, have taken this upon themselves in Jewish loyalty. Our work in Theresienstadt, serious and full of trials as it is, also serves this end. To be God's servants, and as such to move from earthly spheres to heavenly ones. May all our work be a blessing for Israel's future and the future of humanity. Upright Jewish men, brave and noble women were always sustainers of our people. May we be found worthy by God to be numbered in the circle of these women and men. The reward of a mitzvah is the recognition of a great deed by God. How could the world forget a great rabbi like this? How could we forget a teacher, a compassionate Jew, whose selfless devotion to our people eased their comfort and pain in a most tumultuous time, in a transition time of Jewish life? Our study mission this summer tried to atone that loss of her dignity and memory. And so we gathered in Terezin to dedicate a memorial plaque to her in a solemn ceremony with dignitaries from both Germany and the Czech Republic, European Jewish community leaders, and the first four American rabbis of East Dream, along with several other leading women rabbis and women scholars. We dedicated a memorial to her in the Columbarium at Terezin. With the child and the grandchild of child survivor of Terezin, Helga Wysova Hoskova, playing the music, we read Rabiner Jonas' own words, chanted the El Male Rafami, and recited Kaddish in her memory. This holy and extremely moving spiritual moment that I experienced taught me some great lessons. It's one that I, some that I wish to share with you this morning. Memory is a very fragile thing. If we do not share our memories, our stories, our remembrances, it might be that we never existed. We cannot fully build any future if the past is forgotten. <clears throat> very moving. I tell you her story on this Yom Kippur morning because she's a hero. She imagined a future even in a time of great darkness. She continued to teach hope when the world was in a horrible transition. If we forget the past completely, as we did Rabiner Jonas, we may miss some important understandings and teachings that could help us along the way to imagining our present and our future. And on holy days such as Yom Kippur, we are commanded to remember the past precisely for this reason. We will recite the Yisker service in just a few minutes. We will recall our loved ones' memories, their lives and everything about them, good and not so good. We pray that their teaching and guidance that they gave to us will help ground us in the new year. For some of you, it will be the only time that you recite Kaddish for them. Your lives are seemingly too busy to take a Shabbat, to come to temple, to recite the prayer for their memorial. But my friends, this is a way of forgetting the past. 
and excising them from our present and our future. But on this day, you have the power in your hands to keep memory and history alive by the choices that you make and still in doing shape a bright Jewish future. Judaism as a whole is in another transition moment, a really large one. Our institutions are reeling from the changes in attendance patterns and support, in generational interests that differ from the past. The recent Pew study confirmed for us in leadership what we already knew, that Jews were marching with their feet to a different drummer. You all are marching away from the synagogue and affiliation in the community. In an increasingly secular America, Jews are increasingly secular and non-observant. Many of you might call yourself spiritual, but I'm not religious. Perhaps like some of you, once or twice a year is just enough. But my friends, I tell you this because it is not enough to sustain Jewish institutions dedicated to Jewish life all year long. On this holiest of days, I ask you to consider if Judaism has relevance in your day-to-day -day life. I ask you if the values and teachings of our traditions have impact upon your actions. If the rituals of our year and life cycle speak to you. I ask you to turn towards the Jewish people and community amid this great time of transition in Jewish culture. Now is the time to recreate and reimagine how the synagogue and other Jewish institutions function, how they are funded, how they look, and perhaps even what their missions are all about. But it isn't only the institution itself that must take stock, but each one of us. I'm asking each of you, challenging each of you, to be a more committed and connected Jew. Rabbi Jonas managed to do so, even in the depths of the greatest evil. At this holy season of turning of Chuba, let us repent for our sin of indifference to Jewish life and to the life of our Jewish spirit. Individuals, each one of us, at this season, must look inside to see whether our actions contribute to this dramatic transition in Jewish life. In this time of Jewish transition, as the world is less than safe for Jews, the Jewish people needs each one of you. Each of your families, whether your spouse or children are Jewish or not, we need your connection and your involvement. The Jewish community and the synagogue are going through transitions, but we cannot and will not survive the dark forces of assimilation and annihilation that lurk ever so close if each of you absent yourself from the process. The Jews of Berlin thought they were safe as well. And although we ultimately have survived and thrived, much was lost and much not remembered, such as Rabina Jonas's story demonstrates to us. <laughs> there is one more transition that this season that we must make note of and mention, and that is of our beloved Cantor Saltzman. After today, he will transition to that glorious position of emeritus, <laughs> Cantor emeritus. And after more than 40 years of cantering, He's been doing this since he was a young teenager in Barstow. His transition to retirement from the active cantorate is not the end of a relationship with all of us, but just a new phase. This is a transition for him and for our congregation. For me and for many of you, his voice carries our prayers heavenward, and his spirit embraces our souls. I know you join me in wishing him Bahatslacha success, rest, creativity, joy, and lots of time in Italy with Walter. <laughs>
about transitions. The transitions in each of you. From the person that you were in the past to the person you are yet to become. This holy day, through our prayers, our remembrances, our tshuva and tzedakah, we can bring out the person who we always hope to be. We can be born anew. And we can, with the right imagination, heal ourselves and the relationships we have entered into so that they may blossom with vibrancy. I believe Jewish life is still rich and alive, even with its many transitions, like Jonas and Frankel, who sought to make meaning out of that dark time of the Shoah, we too are searchers for meaning in our own day and time. We look to create a sense of belonging where there is none, a sense of hope when we are hopeless, a sense of goodness when there is evil in the world. My friends, that is our Jewish task. And this is what we are trying to do here today on Yom Kippur as we cleanse our souls of the traumas the sins, and the imperfections that marred our daily life in the past year. God, help us to start fresh. Help us remember that which we have forgotten. Help us to face our future with hope and with strength, and embolden us to think and act with you, God, in mind. Help each one of us transition in this new year to being a more active part of the Jewish people, carrying on the covenant of our ancestors. As our Torah portion will tell us in a few moments, you stand committed before Adonai your God this day, attendance of Im Hayom Kulchem, this day Adonai Elohechem. Today we too must stand committed before our God to a life connected by our covenant to the very Holy One of Blessing and a covenant to one another to strengthen our souls, our people, our congregation, and ourselves. Can you hear us so? So may it be God's own.